I'm Amanda Lou from, from Human Rights Water, and I'm joined on the screen at the moment with Callum Clench from IWRA and Pezzi Obana, who's an associate professor at the University of Bradford, who's leading our session today. Uh, this is the fifth and last in our series of five modules. On uh, it's our masterclass that we've done conjointly with uh, with the International Water Resources Association and the South African Water Research Commission. So it's been uh, a really interesting five weeks. Each week has involved different experts from our three organizations talking about um, the human rights-based approach process and how it can uh, support institutional responsibility. And we've featured a different topic each week. This last week leads us to um, how we monitor using human rights-based indicators which brings us to the close of the, the process that we would normally follow in, a, in developing a human rights-based um, approach. So I, I don't want to talk for too long because I'm not the expert. I'm going to pass over now to Callum, who's going to give you an introduction from the IWA perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I'm Callum Clench, the executive director here at the IWRA. And it is my pleasure to, to welcome all of you again. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to join the earlier classes uh, myself. I was uh, traveling for the most part doing other things, but I've heard wonderful uh, feedback about the, the classes that have been held so far. Uh, from what I see with um, the public lectures themselves, we've had over 700 people register for these. And uh, I believe that we've had a fairly high attendance, about 140 participants, I think on average which is really great for the public lectures. And then of course we have the, the skills building workshops that follow and, and I think we have over 30 people who have registered for those, um, which are also, uh, it's really, really great. And I'd like to extend our gratitude to, to each of the participants, you know, for your commitment to keep coming back to these uh, over the past few weeks and your enthusiasm has sort of encouraged us to, to, to work even harder on this project. Um, I'd also like to, to thank uh, our partners, of course. We have the Human Right to Water, Amanda, I mean, has been uh, really the, leading this, this particular initiative, and, and I want to thank her, as well as Africa's Water Research Commission, have also been a, a really amazing. And of course, we should also thank those uh, experts that you've been listening to. So Dr. Uh, Luxon Namo uh, and uh, Yuri Ramakisun. Uh, Yuri, I think I can see you're here already online as well. Raya Marina Stefan, um, Petty, of course, who you'll be hearing from today, and Michelle Heisterman. Um, you know, without their contribution, these masterclasses wouldn't at all be possible. And, and they're they're volunteering their, their expertise and knowledge uh, to share with you. So thank you very much for that. Um, at IWRA, we believe that timely collaboration is essential in addressing the pressing global water challenges that are facing our planet. And so we've been running these masterclass series now. Uh, for a couple of years, and uh, we try to focus each time on a on a relevant theme uh, that's uh, important to our membership, but also our community. And uh, we we intend to keep doing these in the in the future years. Um, we're also thrilled that this year's virtual masterclass on institutional responsibility to support SDG six and the rights to water sanitation. This masterclass series was designed to help authorities and businesses uh, to improve their relationships with their communities and to support the sustainable development goals, specifically SDG 6. So moreover, this course provides a practical approach for integrating a human rights based approach to meet corporate sustainability due diligence standards. So it's, it's, a, it's a lofty goal that we have. Um, go to our website, of course, uh, iwra.org to access uh, all of the masterclass recordings and presentations from this course. And of course, learn more about IWRA. And, and of course, we would welcome you to become members of our association uh, for so you can attend things like the, the, the workshop afterwards, but also other things that we do. So that's enough for me. I, can, um, I don't wanna take up any more time. I wanna thank uh, you for joining us again and being part of this opportunity. And I'm gonna hand over now to uh, your lecturer for today, so Dr. Pedi Obani, who is Associate Professor at the School of Law at the University of Bradford and a Visiting Research Fellow in Water, Security, Policy and Governance at the University of Leeds. So Pedi, over to you. Thank you very much for your warm introduction, Callum. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here again. 
for the final masterclass in the series. So today we're going to be talking about human rights indicators. I'll just share my screen because I've got a few slides to guide us through the conversation. We'll be looking at human rights indicators as a tool for realizing SDG 6. Um, Amanda already started us off by doing a recap of the previous weeks. So I won't go too much into that, but just to say that our conversation today is building on all the things we've talked about in the past four weeks. So we started out with looking at the main issues, the challenges, the responsibilities, the business case, as well as the intersections between SDG 6 and the human rights to water and sanitation in the first week. In the second week, we went into a bit more detail looking at the human rights to water and sanitation in relation to corporate due diligence and accountability for sustainability. So essentially, how can corporations, businesses, and of course, governments as well, through corporate due diligence, promote the realization of the rights to water and sanitation. In that week, we also looked at the principles of the rights to water and sanitation. We looked at the criteria, we looked at the forms of legal obligations, which human rights um, raised human rights-based approach imposes and the reasons, the rationale for still conversing for the human rights to water and sanitation, even though we have the SDG 6. So we looked at the complementarities, but also the slight differences and the ways in which the human rights framework can enrich our realization or our goals or our pursuits of SDG 6. And in week three, we did more of a situational analysis from a human rights-based approach. So essentially, having talked about the relationships between human rights and SDG 6, it was then more about considering where the gaps lie in terms of how do we identify the capacity gaps wherever we sit, whether as regulators or as providers or as NGO, civil society, um, community-based organizations. And we also explored ways in which we can prioritize people in vulnerable situations within the framework of understanding the issues and we discussed stakeholder engagement, all in light of understanding that we have to know where the issues lie. If we don't identify the problems correctly, then we might not be able to come up with the right solutions either. And in the fourth week, which is last week, we did more focus on stakeholder engagement and exploring the ways in which we go beyond CSR. CSR being considered more as a voluntary approach. But of course, we know that in some jurisdictions, there are legally binding obligations to engage in corporate social responsibility. So we did all of that. And today we're ending with um, looking at human rights indicators. I see a hand up. Um, is there a question or Abdul Kabir? Um, we just can we just ask everyone to send their uh, questions using the Q and A feature? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. So we'll um, we'll keep some time towards the end for the questions and answers. So at that point, if anyone wants to come to the mic, you know, we're more than happy to do that. And then we'll also address the questions in the Q and A. So I'm mindful of. The fact that we need some time for questions as well. Thank you. So for today, we'll be looking at human rights indicators and we have more or less five main um, objectives. The first would be to try and understand what we mean by human rights indicators, because of course we already have indicators, for instance, from the sustainable development goals. So when we say human rights indicators, what exactly do we have in mind there? Secondly, we would consider the methodology for designing priority indicators for monitoring. And this is born out of an understanding that there could be so many indicators, you know, if we want to look at all of the different principles, criteria, aspects of the human rights to water and sanitation. So if we are thinking of starting, where do we start from? What methods can we employ in order to design indicators that will be appropriate to our context or to our um, settings, wherever we might be. So that's one of the things we'd look at. The third thing is having discussed the methodology for designing indicators, we will then think about how we can monitor and evaluate those indicators because it is one thing to design and implement, but it's also important that we actually monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of those indicators so that when necessary, we can go back, review updates as um, needed to make the system more effective. And then we'll explore the steps for setting up a framework for monitoring the indicators. And finally, we would look at methodological considerations. So in 
designing indicators in monitoring indicators in um, setting up frameworks for monitoring those indicators. What are the methodological issues that we need to have bear in mind? Now for the opening reflection, I'd like you to think a bit uh, about the reason for looking at human rights indicators. I know that I have introduced this in connection with the past four weeks, but from where you sit to your mind, why do you think we need to focus on human rights indicators? I'm going to show some pictures and what I'd like you to do is to use the chat function and one picture comes up, it'll be on the screen for maybe three seconds. I want you to just write the first thing that comes to your mind in terms of why would it be important for us to think about indicators, specifically human rights indicators. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It's more about, um, it's more about more or less putting ourselves in that space of actually um, understanding the relevance of human rights indicators to us wherever we sit and being um, more or less uh, using those pictures as a way of triggering our connections with human rights indicators. So this is the first picture. So please use the chat box and just say when you see this picture and you think about the importance of focusing on indicators, what comes to mind, what's one word? comes to your mind. So I'm curious to see what people write in the chat box. I think we've just enabled the chat box for everybody. It wasn't enabled oh. before, so there may be a slight delay. Thanks yeah, for that. Go. Yeah, okay. thank you. So time is ticking, period. Time is running out. Yeah, time. Hurry. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if you think about SDG 6, for instance, we're thinking 2030, so it's time bound. We need to do something speed, hurry, okay? Thank you. I'll, I'll put up the next picture. What comes to your mind when you see this one? Okay, indicators reflect goals to be achieved in protection of human rights, okay? Delays on improvements of situation, sanitation solution, measure, okay? Growing up, yeah, childhood, okay? Future generation, children, equity, higher, grow together, growth, okay? Yep. Development, okay? What comes to mind when you say this one? Perhaps you can guess that I had pancakes for breakfast today. <laughs> Being happy together, cooperation and affection, next generation. So I assume this was for the last one, okay? This one, there's baking, healthy food, nutrients, collaboration, okay? Lacks water, interesting, yeah? Okay, uh, we have the... WEF, I think that's water, energy, food, nexus, okay? What we need to survive, nutrition, cooperation. It takes many things to reach the goal, interesting. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll put up the next picture, togetherness. What comes to mind, multi-stakeholder, thank you. Needs of life, what comes to mind when we see this picture and we think about um, human rights indicators, measure, mm -hmm. measurement, yeah. It should be measurable, measure, size, suitable size, monitoring, conciseness, measurable goals, quantify, plan, fitted. Yep. Size, precision, perfection. Okay. Thank you so much to everyone. Suitability, computation. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everyone who took part in that. And like I said, there's no right, there's no wrong, but I'm hoping that from all the responses we've gotten, innovation, inclusion, we already see the need to focus on human rights indicators. So we had people talk about time running out. We had people talk about the need to measure growth, the need to measure progress, the need to have different stakeholders, the need for inclusion. So all of this points to why the human rights indicators are important in our quest for achieving SDG 6. So thank you. Now, 
as a reminder again, what should we be measuring? We should be measuring the normative content principles cross-cutting themes that we have already identified in the previous sessions as the key elements of the rights to water and sanitation. So just to remind ourselves, the normative content and principles includes being that uh, includes sufficiency. So we need to ensure that water sanitation services are sufficient. So how do we measure that? That's one thing we would need to measure. And we've identified safety as another normative content of the rights. So again, in thinking about indicators, perhaps we want to be thinking about how do we measure the safety of the services and safety for whom? Safety for the users, safety for the environment, safety for the service providers. You know, how do we measure all of those um, elements of safety? We talked about acceptability as part of the normative content. So again, how do we measure acceptability and acceptability for whom? How do we measure physically accessible or physical accessibility? How do we measure affordability? Things like non-discrimination, access to information and transparency, public participation, sustainability and empowerment. Specifically with the course cutting things, we, when we looked at the pictures, I know the one that had the things for bacon, um, some of the responses were saying togetherness, you know, the different components, the stakeholders. So again, if we look at those normative contents and principles, and if we look specifically at the cross-cutting teams, we're reminded that perhaps in measuring some of these elements, the answers we get will not only tell us about the rights to water and sanitation, but will tell us about our progress with human rights-based approach, broadly speaking. Because non-discrimination, for instance, what it means in water and sanitation would also have implications in other aspects of life. In, for instance, education, work, food, you know, other human rights. So within the context of human rights indicators for water and sanitation, there could also be lessons, there could also be messages, there could also be outcomes that are relevant for other human rights as well. So that's just something to have at the back of our minds. Now with the SDGs, we already have indicators. So just to remind us in week two, we talked about the fact that SDG six captures most of the criteria of the human rights to water and sanitation. So if we look at target 6.1, for instance, which is focused on water, it talks about achieving by 2030 universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. And then if you look at SDG 6 point, target 6.2, it talks again, uh, it talks about again by 2030 achieving access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all and ending open defecation paying special attention to the needs of women and girls and those in vulnerable situations. So these targets of the sustainable development goals for water and sanitation, including hygiene, encompass most of the criteria of um, the rights to water and sanitation. But if we look at the targets, we see that affordability, for instance, is missing. We see that acceptability is missing because the measurement is mainly around safe um, water services, safe sanitation services, and safety being measured in terms of the facilities, how many people use them, and whether or not it brings or causes harm to the users. So thinking about those human rights normative contents we already um, mentioned, we see that the SDGs and the SDG indicators or measurements do not um, cover all the aspects of the human rights to water and sanitation. So there's still a gap that needs to be addressed, even though the SDGs takes into account the needs to ensure universal access. So what is a human rights indicator? I think this definition here from the OHCHR um, very broadly covers the main elements of what it is. And the definition mentions that a human rights indicator is a specific information on the state or condition of an object, event, activity or outcome that can be related to human rights norms and standards that addresses and reflects human rights principles and concerns and that can be used to assess and monitor the promotion and implementation of human rights. So essentially if we replace water sanitation uh, in this definition 
a human rights indicator for water or sanitation will be one that provides a specific information on the state or condition of water and sanitation that can be related to the human rights norms and standards, which we already considered, and one that addresses and reflects the human rights principles and consents for water and sanitation, and can be used to assess and monitor the promotion and implementation of the rights to water and sanitation. Now, the indicators can be qualitative, can be quantitative, the indicators can be used not only to measure the outcomes or to assess progress, but even to measure the intent, to measure the actions, to measure the commitments made by states, to measure the impact on the rights holders on the environment, and also to measure all of those cross-cutting teams which we identified that are relevant for water and sanitation. Now, in terms of the difference between quantitative and qualitative um, indicators, this table here captures the essence of it. Quantitative um, indicators are very often numbers, numbers based on information about sanitation services, water services, or events related to any of those. And in principle, they can be directly observed and verifiable. So an example I've provided here is the number of toilets in a city. If we want to talk about the number of toilets or public toilets, or you want to talk about the number of taps, it's very easy to, well, not easy in terms of the process, but it's, it's a measurement that can be verifiable or observed by someone else directly. On the other hand, you could have quantitative indicators that are also subjective. So again, quantitative indicators that are subjective would be still in the format of numbers and based on information, but more around perception, opinion, assessments, or judgments. So we might, for instance, want to count the number of people who feel that the taps in the city are um, conducive or the taps in the city are um, appropriate appropriately positioned for their needs. And that will depend on the people's experiences, that will depend on their values, that will depend on what is important to them. And as we know, we're all different. So our perceptions, our opinions, our judgments, our assessments would very often also be different depending on our individual circumstances and experiences. And another example could be, for instance, if we decided that we wanted to check um, what percentage of people feel safe using the toilets in a city at night. So again, the percentage is a number that makes it quantitative, but the feeling of safety or the perception of safety is a judgment call and it is subjective and it will depend on the people we speak to and what their experiences have been. So to that extent, it is a quantitative indicator, but it is one that is subjective because we're relying on people's perceptions or feelings or experiences. We could also have qualitative indicators. Now, qualitative indicators aren't necessarily numbers, but they are more expressed as a narrative. So we're describing something, or we are explaining something, or we're using a qualifying object, um, object or we're using a qualifying adjective in relation to an object or a fact or event, which again can be observed and verifiable. So for instance, if we want to look at the status of ratification of, let's say the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights for a country, that is a qualitative indicator because it's not about numbers, it's about whether or not the country has ratified the treaty. So that is qualitative. And to that extent that we can actually verify it based on the records, the official records, it is fact-based, it is objective. But we could also have qualitative indicators that are more based on perception, opinion, assessments, or judgments. And in that case, it is about asking to what extent is the, let's say, um, recognition of the rights to water and sanitation 
fully guaranteed in law or in practice in a country. So it's not something we can measure in terms of numbers, but we can measure it in terms of the narrative or in terms of the qualifier based on the experiences, perception, judgment, perhaps the judgment of experts who have looked into the issue. So broadly speaking, some indicators could be quantitative, indicators could also be qualitative, indicators could be fact-based, but it could also be based on judgment or subjective. And during the workshop, one of the questions we'll be asking would be, which of these do you think is more effective and why? Are you more inclined to use quantitative or qualitative and under what circumstances? And I'm hoping that we will see that in practical terms, there are no absolute truths. So it's not a question of one is better than the other. It will depend on the circumstances. It will depend on the available information. It will depend on even the outcomes or what kinds of um, criteria we're trying to uh, judge or evaluate. So for instance, if we wanted to confirm the status of ratification, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to quantitative indicators for a specific country we would have to rely more on qualitative indicators. But of course, if we're looking at on a broad scale, how many countries have ratified, then that could lend itself to quantitative indicators. So it's that kind of um, difference. Now, having stated that, we can also compare human rights assessment or the use of human rights indicators to performance assessments, which we very often find in projects-based assessments of water and sanitation service delivery. So if you look at projects and performance assessments of projects in the sector, some of the main indicators are focused on inputs. So what has gone into the project? Sometimes it's about outputs, you know, what has come out of the project or outcomes and impacts, maybe impacts on the communities where the projects are based or impacts on the wider society. But essentially with performance assessments, they are more concerned with, or we are more concerned with what have we put into this project and what has come out of it within the context of the broad objectives of that project. So the assessment and the things we're looking for, and indeed the markers of success or failure are informed by the specific objectives of that program or that project. Whereas with the human rights compliance assessment, we're going beyond specific objectives of projects or programming to think about human rights standards, human rights norms and principles. And we're not only looking at the direct outcomes or outputs of whatever efforts we've put in, but we start from the very basics to think about the commitments that have been entered into by the states and other non-state actors that might be relevant to actualizing those commitments. And that's when we talk about structural indicators, which we'll talk a bit more about in another slide. We also measure the efforts that have been put in because with um, rights that are of a civil, of, of a social, cultural, economic nature, as we have with the rights to water and sanitation linked to the right to an adequate standard of living, uh, the right to health and other similar rights under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, they are subject to progressive realization, which means that realistically, we may not be able to achieve them at once, but we need to be able to ensure that our efforts towards realizing them progressively get better. We do not retrogress. With each step we take, with each intervention, with each impulse, we are improving on previous efforts towards realizing universal access, which is where the results then come in. But we want to measure progress along the way. So we're looking at the commitments, we're looking at the efforts, and then we're looking at the results. Now, how do we design priority indicators for monitoring? So depending on wherever we sit, how do we go about selecting indicators that could enable us actually advance SDG 6 based on human rights standards? One of the first things we would need to do would be to identify the attributes of the rights to water and sanitation. Essentially, identify the human rights norms, principles, cross-cutting themes that we want to focus on as a priority. And this should be informed by international law, 
regional laws, national, local laws as relevant. So I've listed here some examples of um, sources of law that we could refer to in defining the attributes that we would focus on for our priority indicators. So this would be our treaties, the general comments on water and sanitation rights, the United Nations General Assembly resolutions as relevant, the Human Rights Council resolutions, the regional human rights treaties, national laws and constitutions, decisions of courts, just an indicative list of some of the sources that could actually allow us identify the main attributes of the rights to water and sanitation that's called from the basis for designing indicators. The second step to take would be that we understand, recognize, and integrate the indivisibility and interdependence of human rights norms and principles. So remember at the beginning, I mentioned that in measuring one aspect, we could actually get information about other human rights and broadly speaking, the human rights based approach. So if we recognize that indivisibility, that interdependence of human rights norms and principles, we could actually find new ways of measuring based on existing systems that perhaps have been applied for other rights as well. So for instance, if within the school system, there's already an indicator of how many girls are missing school and why, that could give us insights into access to sanitation in schools for girls or access to menstrual hygiene management systems for girls in schools, even though we started out by thinking of education. So if we think broadly and recognize the interdependence and indivisibility of human rights, we could find ourselves actually selecting indicators that will be effective for monitoring um, human rights to water and sanitation. And we could harness resources that already exist in the system. A third thing would then be that we're able to define the indicators that we want to use but we define them explicitly and precisely. Now, it is important that we're explicit and precise because explicit in the sense that we all want to agree on what those indicators are and what it is that we're measuring. And some of the things to bear in mind in selecting indicators that are explicit and precise is that we use a methodology for collection, processing and disseminating the data that is acceptable. And we'll talk about acceptability and the ethical issues in a bit more detail when we think about the methodological considerations towards the end. The other thing we want to do is that we want to select indicators that are available on a regular basis. So we don't want indicators that um, we have them today, we don't have them tomorrow, or we don't want indicators that do not allow us to be able to measure progress from, you know, wherever we may have started from to where we are currently and, you know, going forward. So we have to find indicators that we know are regularly um, available and accessible as well. Some of the main sources of information that we could rely on to inform us or inform our understanding or our measurement of the, the, the situation using indicators could be socioeconomic data, administrative statistics. So in most countries where you have population census, those um, census figures would cover things like access to um, basic services such as water, sanitation, the type of household, the location, the number of people in the households, um, how much money is being spent on basic necessities. So all of those are ways of getting information to support our understanding and monitoring of the rights to water and sanitation. We could also rely on statistical surveys. So again, most countries would have um, agencies or departments that conduct statistical surveys at the national level, but also sometimes at the sub-national levels. So that could give us insights into the statistics on access to water and sanitation. We could also get the information from events-based data on human rights violations. So sometimes there are reports on access to um, facilities or um, the rights to health. So looking at health care facilities and the kinds of services that are available to people who use those facilities, where the gaps exist, that could inform our understanding or that could inform or provide us with data that could then be applied for monitoring the rights to water and sanitation. We could also rely on perceptions and opinion surveys, as well as expert judgment, which, as we mentioned previously, are valid sources of um, indicators or data 
for measuring access and um, progress with realizing the rights to water and sanitation. Now, what are the considerations? How do we select these indicators? I found this acronym while doing the research called RIGHTS, and I thought that was quite um, apt because one, it's easy to remember, but secondly, it captures the main elements that we want to look out for in selecting human rights indicators that are effective, but also um, are they're effective, but also can communicate across different um, sectors and different jurisdictions as well. One of them is that we want our indicators to be relevant and reliable. So that's where the R comes from, relevant and reliable. The second is that we want our indicators to be independently collected in a way that removes the subjects being monitored from that process as a way of, again, ensuring reliability, but also ensuring that the data that we have is independent and verifiable. A third consideration is that we want it to be globally and universally meaningful, but at the same time, adaptable to the context in which it is being used and disaggregated based on prohibited human rights um, violation grounds, such as grounds of discrimination. So essentially, globally and universally meaningful, because like I said, with the human rights is an international standard, but at the same time, we know that what it means and how it is implemented at the sub-national level needs to reflect the local priorities, needs to reflect the local realities. And that in itself means that international standards, international principles and commitments have to be adapted to the local context. So that's what this third consideration is about. It's about merging or finding a way to balance the global relevance with the local context. The fourth is that the indicators have to be human rights centric or have to be based on human rights standards, have to be linked to human rights norms and principles, which we already identified. And the fifth is that we need to have transparent methods for actually using those indicators, finding those indicators, um, monitoring those indicators. So the methods need to be transparent, but also timely and time bound. And the time bound meaning we need to sort of set um, targets for ourselves that we can measure progress towards. So sometimes if we think about indicators and think about progress in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term, but what does that medium term mean for you? What does the long term mean for you? If you look at the example of the SDGs, for instance, we already have 2030 as the cutoff period. So if we, if we need to design indicators measuring our progress, perhaps we need to then think about it in terms of by 2030, if we want to have achieved 100%, do we want to have threshold indicators that show us that actually we're making progress towards universal access by 2030, rather than wait until 2030 and then realize that we haven't achieved the purpose? And then what do we do at that point? And finally, we need indicators that are simple and specific. Simple and specific so that they can be communicated easily, but also so that they can be measured easily as well. well easily said with some caution, but essentially we want indicators that are simple and specific so that whoever's measuring knows what to look out for. And when they find it, they also know what they have found and are able to communicate that um, meaningfully to other stakeholders. So rights, just as a way of reminding ourselves, relevant and reliable, independent data collection methods, global and universally meaningful, but also adaptable to the local context, human rights standard centric, transparent methods, timely and time bound, as well as simple and specific. Now, a bit more about the structural process and outcome indicators. So we already mentioned uh, within the human rights indicators framing, we talk about structural indicators, we talk about process indicators and outcome indicators. So the structural indicators speak more to the institutional arrangements that have been put in place to ensure the realization of the rights. Within structural indicators, we look at the commitments that the government has entered into. We look at the institutional frameworks that have been established at the national, but also the sub-national level. 
An example could be, for instance, whether or not the right to water is recognized in the national constitution. That would be a structural indicator. Moving to the process indicators. Process indicators are more about the milestones. How do we measure progressive realization? How do we show that we are moving, we are moving from where we've started towards where we want to be? And how do we ensure that we are not retrogressing? So those indicators that allow us to show um, progress, that allow us to show milestones, that allow us to show um, the changes within the system are process indicators. Now, an example could be, for instance, whether we're involving disadvantaged populations in the governance of water or in the design of water facilities. That would be a process indicator because it's showing us whether we're able to bring in disadvantaged populations within the framework, within the system, within the institutions that would enable us to achieve the outcome of universal access. And so the outcome indicators are ultimately the results we want to achieve, or those indicators that allow us to measure the results, that allow us to measure the final um, goals that we have in mind for the human rights to water and sanitation. Outcome indicators could show individual attainments or individual achievements, but they could also show collective achievements or attainments. And an example would be, for instance, what proportion of disadvantaged populations have access to water facilities? So for monitoring and evaluation, how do we conduct this? One of the first things we need to do would be that we map the state's commitments or the government's commitments to the rights to water and sanitation at the international level, but we don't stop there. We see how that has been translated into the domestic legal system. So that's the legal mapping. The second thing we'd want to do for monitoring and evaluation would be that we're able to establish a baseline for planning. So with the MDGs, for instance, we had a baseline year. So within the national systems, we need a baseline. So for instance, we could say, okay, compared to where we were in 20, 2000, in year 2000, or compared to where we were in year 2010, where do we want to see ourselves by 2030? So that becomes the baseline for planning. A third thing we want to do to be able to establish a monitor and evaluation is that we want to be able to measure progress using disaggregated data. Because it is only when we disaggregate the data that we're able to see the gaps and the weaknesses and in disaggregating the data, it's important that we link this to the grounds for non-discrimination. So those populations that are very often in vulnerable situations or marginalized should be the basis for the disaggregation of data so that we're measuring the progress along the lines of promoting inclusion, promoting non-discrimination, promoting equity. And finally, when we design our monitoring and evaluation systems, we need to think about validating and also engaging with the relevant stakeholders to gain their approval and their buy-in. So those are four things or four steps we need to follow in advancing monitoring and evaluation once we've designed our indicators. Now, the final thing we would look at would be how do we set up a framework for monitoring human rights indicators? And we've put out here six steps. One is, let's be able to identify the monitoring stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders that will be involved in the process? And if we think back to uh, week three and week four, we already talked about some of the things to do in stakeholder engagement, especially in week four. The second thing we want to do is that we want to be able to facilitate inclusive domestic monitoring processes. So once we have the right stakeholders in the room, the right stakeholders not being only the major groups, but also the groups in vulnerable situations, that in itself would advance inclusion. And thirdly, once we have those stakeholders represented, then they will be able to inform the identification of other major vulnerable and marginalized groups. And fourthly, we want to ensure that the framework for monitoring human rights indicators prioritizes non-discrimination and accessibility for those vulnerable and marginalized groups. Fifth, we need to build capacity for data collection, disaggregation, 
processing and dissemination. So it's not just about collecting the data. We need to disaggregate that data. We need to be able to make sense of the data and that entails processing. And finally, we need to be able to disseminate the data to the right channels to inform action and reforms of the system where needed. We also need to be able to report on periodicity. So we need to report periodically. We need to publish and we need to ensure that there's access to the information and follow up because it is that access to information that enables civil society groups and other stakeholders to take um, necess necessary steps to hold the government to account, but also to hold other non-state actors to account and ensure that there's accountability and transparency in advancing the rights to water and sanitation. Now, in all of this, as we define our indicators, as we decide on how to measure, as we engage with stakeholders, there are some concerns from a methodological perspective. So there are some issues we need to bear in mind, essentially. One of them is that we have to ensure that the broader human rights implications of that process of you know, um, deciding what the indicators are, collecting the data, processing and disseminating are clearly um, defined, but also clearly addressed. So the right to information, the right to privacy, data protection and confidentiality, the right of participation, the rights of erasure, sometimes described as a right to be forgotten, and the principle of self-identification need to be taken into, into account. This essentially means that when we're collecting data on our human rights indicators, we should ensure that we do not in the process violate other rights of people. So we should not, for instance, um, force people to get involved in the process because we want to collect data on the rights of water and sanitation. No, people should be able to choose whether they want to take part or not. And when people decide to take part, if they do, then we need to guarantee their right to privacy. We need to guarantee their right to data protection and confidentiality. We also need to ensure that when people are in situations of vulnerability, the, the principle of self-identification, essentially, they are not, they're not forced to expose information that will threaten their well-being or that will expose them to other risks in the process. So those are things we have to be mindful of. And we also have to ensure that we comply with legal and institutional standards on research ethics, data, data handling, as well as human rights. So those are things we have to take into account so that we do not, in the process of um, trying to solve one problem, create other problems, whether for ourselves or for the people that we work with. So this is a list of other resources that are useful. And with that, we've come to the end and we can look at the questions. Thank you. Paddy, I can, I can read the questions to you and perhaps you can address them, that might be easier. Thank you very uh, much. Okay, so we've we've got a few. Um, the perhaps the most relevant one is um, what are the what could the human rights based indicators in the context in the context of accountability be? So I think that it might be a good opportunity to, for you to give an example. Excellent, thank you very much. So if we think about the human rights indicators in terms of accountability, again we could consider whether we want them to be qualitative or quantitative. And then we could think about them in terms of the structure, the process and the outcomes. So in terms of the structure, for instance, we could have, let's say, um, looking at whether or not the government even has in place a framework that allows for accountability to the people. So is there an institution in place or is there a provision in the law that mandates accountability from the government? And what does that accountability mean for us? Are we talking about accountability in terms of um, government expenditure? Are we talking about accountability in terms of the governance process? So that is one aspect, the structural aspect. The second could be the process. So we could have an indicator that, for instance, measures um, whether or not the government has in place a structure that allows young people to get involved in the process of um, demanding accountability? Is there a system in place or is there a process or is there um, a space where young people can actually get involved in the process of 
governance of the um, water and sanitation services or get involved in the process of um, monitoring the government's expenditures in relation to water and sanitation. So that could be the process. And then in terms of the outcome for accountability, we could be measuring, for instance, um, what, um, whether or not the government has been reporting on its expenditures or whether or not the government has been reporting on its, um, its so it, reporting on expenditure, reporting on perhaps its um, monitoring or reporting on even the facilities that are within its control and whether those numbers actually show universal access or show progressive realization of the government's commitment in relation to accountability, which is where we started from. So the structure is about are the institutions in place for ensuring accountability? The process could be about are groups such as young people or women or uh, disadvantaged populations or people in um, rural communities or people with some forms of disabilities, are they engaged in that accountability process? And the outcome could be what percentage of these populations or to what extent has the government actually delivered on providing that accountability, whether it's in form of reporting on its expenditures or in form of reporting on its maintenance of facilities or reporting on its um, representation of people's concerns within the national system or at the international level. Thank you. Um... That, I think that's quite helpful. Uh, there's a couple of comments here asking for the access to the resources slide that you showed, but I think we're going to be sharing them afterwards on the yeah. both the IWRA website and the Human Right to Water website. Uh, so they should be available for people afterwards, but as long with the recording. There's a, there's a couple of other questions that aren't directly related to um, the human rights indicators, but you may be able to answer. One is which, uh, which which is asking if there is a world body for monitoring human rights violation and to help reduce or stop, which of course there is. Um, and the other one is, um, uh, are affordability and acceptability not covered under accessibility? And in, in uh, this was from Simon Marewa, who said that in his view, they're not missing in goal six as, as you claim, what do you think? Thank you very much. So in terms of the human rights frameworks, yes. So, um, and it is within that context, we have the special rapporteurs, we have the human rights treaty bodies. So there are mechanisms at the international level for ensuring that human rights can be monitored. And that in itself is one of the reasons for which um, sometimes people advocate for um, issues to be elevated to that level of being recognized as rights. But I think beyond that, it is also important that the national systems also have systems in place. And again, the national systems have those systems in place. In many instances, the courts provide an avenue, not only for um, seeking redress when a right has been violated, but even when there's a risk of violation. So within national systems, we have the court systems, we also have um, national human rights institutions, that again, monitor um, human rights closely and seek to address um, violations where they occur, but also preempt violations and try to put in place measures to ensure that those violations do not actually um, come into being or do not actually affect people. Now, as to the human rights indicators and the SDGs. So the SDG targets, they are broader than the measuring indicators. So if you look at target 6.1, it talks about um, universal, equitable access and affordable. And if you look at 6.2, it talks about achieving access to adequate and equitable, but even then it doesn't talk about affordable. So already there's a mismatch in the two. But if you look at what is being measured, like I said, it's, what we're measuring is safely managed water safely managed sanitation services and safely managed um, water sanitation services it takes into account more that ladder you know moving from um, no access at all and progressively you know moving from no access to having access and then what kind of access is it safe for sanitation is it shared um, are we 
taking the waste away? Are we treating the waste? And all of those do not account for the specific norms of affordability. They do not account even for physical accessibility because the fact that we have a safely managed service doesn't mean that somebody who has some form of disability, for instance, will be able to use that service. So there is a mismatch. And that is where disaggregation becomes important. Because again, the fact that we have safely managed services. So for instance, I'll give an example. Let's say there are 10 of us in the room and the ratio is one toilet to 10 people. One safely managed toilet to 10 people. By that standard, we would say that we have enough because we're only 10 of us and there is one toilet and it is safely managed, meaning the waste is taken away at the end of the day. Uh, the sewage is treated. It doesn't cause harm to the environment. But if we think about physically accessible, for instance, from a human rights perspective, it then means that if someone has any form of physical disability, which requires special considerations that has to be taken into account, then if that one toilet doesn't capture that, it doesn't meet the mark. And that is where the human rights norms becomes important and different. And that is where if we use human rights indicators and we disaggregate, then we might find answers to questions that we didn't even know existed in the beginning when we're only using you know, aggregated data and thinking broadly about safely managed services. Okay, um, we've we've answered most of the questions and I think we're actually getting to the end of our time. There was, I don't know if you want to comment on, there was a question about are there any tools uh, or techniques for measuring accountability? You've kind of answered the question, um, but otherwise I think we're, we're, we're there. Is there anything from the um, human rights to water that we can have as specific examples as well? On accountability? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we've, we've been working in a few countries on human rights indicators, and we have a whole range of example indicators. You can see them on our website under the Kenya project. We've shared the, there's two examples in Masabit and Garissa, where we've gone through the indicators by criteria and by principles. So you can, you can refer to those. But I think um, in accountability, there's a whole range of uh, tools that you can use in terms of feedback mechanisms and accountability that way, um, making sure that they're being followed up. So it's all very well asking people what they think, but then if there is no demonstrable uh, solution provided by the local board authority, then, then you don't know whether or not anything's happened. So there needs that transparency, there needs to be clear accountability that the whatever is given in terms of feedback is then followed up on and there is some response uh, what you know um, people are aware that whatever they're saying in the survey is being acted upon so that that would be one example maybe I mean another thing I can think about with accountability and utilities specifically the fact that um, you don't disconnect people without maybe providing them with a reason for the disconnection and then giving them an opportunity to come back and see what the issues are, how those issues can be resolved and you don't leave them without basic services. Now, mm -hmm. on the one hand, it is accountability, but at the same time, it also links to the rights to information and then it also links to the right to ensure that people have sufficient services and basic services as well. So that comes back to the fact that sometimes we might not be able to measure only one thing by itself, but we more or less have composite indicators. So in measuring the one thing, we are feeding into other things. So in measuring, for instance, access to information, it might be relevant for understanding accountability. In measuring um, the safeguards against disconnections, that could also allow us to understand a bit more about um, accountability as well. So sometimes it is all connected and we might struggle to find just one speaking directly to only one um, indicator or norm as well. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Pedi, uh, I think we've run out of time for, for your lecture, but actually that was fabulous, really full of information. There's a lot of references as well that you shared and they're going to be on the website so that people can have a look at them.
And uh, we're going to move on to the workshop now for some of the people that are registered for that to have a further discussion and to work through some of the examples that you mentioned earlier. So thank you very much. Callum, looks like you're ready to say something. <laughs> I just wanted want to, to say to... that was really interesting and, and thank you, Pity. It was really, it was a very good uh, lecture. So uh, thank you. It was great. Yeah, it was really good. I, it's an area that's really um, becoming much more important. I think that there was quite a few questions about SDG 6 and there was a target that we need to try and achieve, whereas these indicators are going to help us to get there by giving the, giving the local authorities a roadmap for achieving them. So please have a look at all the information online and if you've got any questions, come back to any of us and we'll, we'll try and help you. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.